Okay. Perfect. Great. Thanks a lot. So many thanks for the organizers to allow me to participate in this way since I couldn't make it in person to, to Breckenridge or to Denver. Um, so my point of view of what is useful for creating interpretable models uh, that allow us to understand what's going on in the real neural system is very strongly biased towards dimensionality reduction and finding the manifolds in which the data lives. So let me tell you what I mean by that. So assume that I'm recording from primary motor cortex from area M1 with a multi-electrode array that allows me to record from the order of 800 neurons from a, from a non-human primate, a monkey, who is doing some, some reaching task. In this case, a very simple central task in which the monkey is told, uh, you know, a monk, monkey is focusing at the center, at, at the center uh, target. One of the eight peripheral targets illuminates, there is a whole period, then he gets a go signal, and he's supposed to execute the reach from the center where he's holding to the target that was actually illuminated for that particular trial. And what the monkey does that, we record in primary motor cortex. As I said, this is a multi-electrode array that allows us to record of the order of 100 neurons. Here is a case where we had 80 neurons. This recording is about 20 seconds. Each row corresponds to a different uh, neuron, and each tick is an action potential. It's a spike emitted by that neuron. What we would really like to do, of course, is to be able to monitor the full population activity. And by that, I mean to be able to record all the neurons that are being co-modulated by the task, that are participating in that task. In the particular case of, of motor cortex, if you're doing reach with your arms, reaches with your arms, there is about a million neurons, uh, 10 to the 6 neurons in primary motor cortex that, are, that need to be activated for you to be able to execute that particular reach movement. So I'm going to refer to this scenario where we can record all the neurons that are of interest to us in a given area as recording an infinite number of neurons. It's, of course, it's not infinite, but it's very large, as I said, like 10 to the 6 in primary motor cortex for a typical reach movement. And if we had that data, we would organize it in a matrix of this type that I would call X infinity, where every row corresponds to a neuron. This is neuron 1, the second row is neuron 2, and each column corresponds to a time. So what we do is we a bin uh, time, we consider a discrete time index. So we start at time zero, we go to time one, and we go to time capital T, where capital T is the duration of your recording, the duration of your experiment. In practice, what we do, as I said, is we implant multi-electrode arrays in the area of interest, in this case, the arm area within primary motor cortex, and therefore we only record from a number D of neurons, and we get a matrix which has the same structure as the one I showed you before, but now it only has D rows, one for each one of the neurons that you are recording. So uh, this number D could be of the order of 100, as I said, for multi-electrode arrays, could be of the order of 1,000 or even 10,000 if you're using neuropixels, but it's still very, very small. You are doing a very heavy, we are all, it's, it's a very heavy subsampling of the neural space of interest, which would be of dimension 10 to the 6. But this is the, D is the ambient dimension, is the, the dimensionality of the empirical neural space, where the empirical neural space includes all the neurons that we're actually able to record from. So uh, again, these are our recordings in the, in the center of task here, the ambient dimensionality would be 80. And this is a schematized version of what we're doing. We have a very complicated array of, of neurons, a complicated network of neurons. Some of them are excitatory, some of them are inhibitory. We are putting a sparse number of electrodes, N1, N2, and N3, and we are recording the um, spikes produced by each one of the neurons that we can record from. And therefore, we can construct a neural space where each one of the acts corresponds to the firing activity of each one of the neurons. And at every time t, we will get a point in that neural space. And as the task progresses, we will get a trajectory in that neural space. And the question that we now ask is whether this trajectory fills the whole space, not in the sense of reaching out to infinity, because finite rate, firing rates, of course, can only range from zero to a maximum firing rate, but whether it fills the space of the same dimensionality as the, number, as the number of neurons that we have been able to record? Does it fill a space of the same dimensionality as the ambient dimension that we talked about? 
And the answer is no, luckily for us. What happens is that the dynamics that we see in the neural activity as we track it during the execution of the, of the task is mostly confined to a low dimensional space, a low dimensional subspace within this higher dimensional ambient neural space. So what we see is something like this. This is a very nice um, simulation of synthetic data by Cunningham and you who discussed dimensionality reductions in their 2014 Nature Neuroscience paper, where they are doing essentially what I told you. At any time t, you compute the firing activity of each one of these three neurons. We follow it as a function of time. We follow the trajectory. And we see that this trajectory is confined to a lower dimensional subspace. In this case, a flat hyperplane that is only two dimensional and can be spanned by these variables S1 and S2. Um, S1 and S2 that define that hyperspace as opposed to needing the three variables that we needed to define the neural state space. So um, let's go back to the to the recording of the 18 euros that I was showing you that I was showing you before. So let's we have this complicated um, recording. The is every now and then doing a reach to a different target. I have color coded the targets so there is a target there is a reach to this target, a reach to this target, a reach to this target. And then there is a go signal and the reach is executed in the motion to target takes about 300, 350 milliseconds. So let's take a window of 350 seconds and measure the firing rate of each one of the neurons for each one of these reaches. So for each neuron, you know, it, we would get a, a point in an 80 dimensional space. Well, that's very hard to visualize. So I'm going to pick at random three neurons. This one, which fires kind of intermediate fighting rate, this one that has a very high fighting rate, and this one that has a very low fighting rate. So I'm going to go to a neural space that is spanned by these three axes, neuron, uh, the, the neurons that I pick, neuron 46, neuron 70, neuron 78. So every reach gives me a point in this space because I have only looked at this 350 millisecond window during which the reach is executed. And after we are done putting all the points in this space, we color them according to the target that the reach corresponded to. Well, we see that we don't see anything here, that we do this for visualization purposes. It's not a very useful visualization because this arbitrary three-dimensional space that we have constructed by just choosing three neurons at random doesn't really give us a lot of information about what's happening in the population. But there is hope because instead of doing this blind three-dimensional reduction, we can do a smart three-dimensional reduction, as was done by Chenoy and his collaborators in 2009, in which they use factor analysis. This is data not from motor, but from premotor cortex. And then you see a very interesting thing. You see that now all the points are clustered. They are clustered according to the target that one is reaching for. And moreover, there is very interesting information about the task in this space because if you look at which cluster here is neighbor to which cluster is the same neighborhood relationship that the targets have in real space. So not only we get a low dimensional representation of the task but the neural data is telling us something about how the task is organized in real space. So what I want to argue in the rest of my talk is that contrary to the point of view of, of some of my colleagues, dimensionality reduction is not just a tool for visualization. It's not something that allows me to see a three-dimensional space instead of an 80-dimensional space that I cannot visualize, but it's actually a very useful tool for information processing analysis. Before I do that, let me make a couple of points. I show you an example in which the data was almost all contained in a flat subspace, in a hyperplane. And this hyperplane has a basis constructed by these two unit vectors, U1 and U2. These bases allow me to describe the position of any point within the hyperplane. So it gives me a two-dimensional representation of the hyperplane. And the basis is, is universal. No matter where I am in the hyperplane, I will always have the same basis. But we have to allow for the possibility that the manifold, the low dimensional structure within which the data is embedded is actually not flat, but is actually nonlinear. It's a curved manifold, in which case we can also construct the basis, but the basis changes in orientation as we move from point to point in the manifold. 
So it's clearly easier to find a linear manifold than a nonlinear manifold, and it's clearly easier to describe the location of the points in a linear manifold where we have a unique basis than in a nonlinear manifold where the basis has to be changing point to point. I want to make another point related to this, which is important to keep in mind, is that the true manifold, which might be nonlinear, has an intrinsic dimension. For instance, this ring here has intrinsic dimension one. This ring also has an intrinsic dimension of one. And if you consider the points on the surface of the sphere, the intrinsic dimensionality of that manifold is two. However, if I want to see this ring in a, embedded within a flat, manifold, I need at least two dimensions. This ring is flat. I could put it on the table and look at it. So the embedding dimension, the flat dimension that in which I can embed this nonlinear manifold is two or more, but the minimum is two. But if I now I take the ring and I start making little wiggles out, out of that two-dimensional surface, then I will need a larger embedding dimension, a larger flat space from which the ring can be seen and in this case is three, and imagine that this ring was embedded in a hundred dimensional space, I could be making these little tweaks in any of the remaining 97 dimensions. And every time, although the intrinsic dimension of the ring is still one, I will have to increase by one the flat dimension of the flat manifold within which this nonlinear manifold is embedded. Uh, similarly, in this case, the points on the surface of the sphere correspond to a two-dimensional nonlinear manifold, but if I want to show it in a flat space, I need at least three dimensions. So we should always distinguish the flat dimension, which is what we can do if we only use methods, linear methods for dimensionality reduction from the intrinsic dimension, which is what we would hopefully we would be able to, to understand and to capture if we use nonlinear methods in order to, to learn the manifold, to find the manifold in which the data is actually embedded. Um, so as I said before, the beauty of linear dimensional reduction is first of all, the methods are, are simpler. We all agree on them and they are not infinite. They are just a few. If I say I'm doing principal component analysis or factors analysis, we all agree. We all know what we are doing. And moreover, there exists two, there is exist a basis that allows me to describe that linear money for that flat hyperplane within the neural space, within the empirical neural space of all the neurons that we're recording from. These vectors that span the, the low dimensional manifold in which the neural data is embedded are directions in space. That means they are particular combinations of the activity of neurons. That particular pattern can be excited more or less but always along the direction in which there is a specific proportion between the, activate, the activity of the various neurons that participate on that mode. And we call neural modes, and we argue that within the linear description, these neural modes are sufficient to describe what's going on with the dynamics of the system. So instead of following how every one of the neurons fires as a function of time, I would put concentrate on these two neural modes, this U1 and U2 neural modes that I just showed you, and follow how the activation of the neural modes varies as a function of time. Those are latent variables. The latent variables are the activation of the neural modes. And within this linear description, there is a very simple way of moving from latent variables to firing rates. The transformation is linear and is given by the components of the same vectors, U1 and U2, that I showed you before, these neural modes, U1 and U2, each one of them is a vector in the three-dimensional space, in the d-dimensional space of the, of the empirical manifold. And so this is the vector u1, and this is the vector u2. So the number of rows in this matrix is the dimensionality of the empirical neural space, and the number of columns is the dimensionality of the manifold. And this allows you to transform latent variables onto spiking rates. And so what we argue is that the latent variables are actually the building blocks. They are, the genera in a generative model idea, if I know the latent variables, I can generate the spikes. So the spikes that the single edge, the neurons are implementing are not the basic building block. They are just a manifestation of the activation of the neural modes, a manifestation of the latent dynamics that arises because the neurons are actually connected and they can only fire in these patterns that take into account the collective behavior that emerges because of their connectivity. 
we argued this specifically for the case of movement control in a, in a paper that we published uh, with my collaborators, Gallego, Perich, and Lee Miller, that we were all at Northwestern at the time. Juan Gallego is now at Imperial College, and Matthew Perich is doing a postdoc with uh, Kanaka region in New York. Um, and Lee is my, my experimental collaborator, Lee Miller, at Northwestern. So, we argue there that these latent dynamics, which is a time-dependent activity of the neural modes, are the building blocks of how the brain works. Although we were focusing on motor cortex, we could already tell in, in 2017 that this idea of low-dimensional activity, the neural manifold spanned by neural modes, had been observed in a variety of other cortical areas, in frontal, prefrontal, parietal, visual, auditory, and olfactory. Since then, this is an update, a lot of very interesting work has gone on from observations in areas like, um, like hippocampus in this particular work from the group of David Tang uh, in a very interesting case of the head position circuit a work from Ila Fita's group. And there's also been a very interesting uh, activity trying to understand what is the origin, how come this dynamics that could be, in principle, very high dimensional, what makes it confined to a low dimensional manifold? How does it controlled by the connectivity of the network? How is it controlled by the inputs that are external to the network? So it's, it's a very active topic of discussion. And I want to show you, I want to, before finishing my talk, I want to show you some examples. This is a lovely paper from uh, Brennan and Precht. The nonlinear dimensionality reduction was used doing a method called DPCA, the Mixed Principal Component Analysis, first proposed by Bredel, Roman, Machels in, in 2011. There is an, another beautiful paper also in eLife that, that extends these ideas and applies them to, to the describing the, act, the activity of a neural population. This is work done on C. elegans data. So C. elegans have a very limited repertoire of behaviors. They can either move forward, that's in blue. They can do turns, dorsal or ventral turns. They can reverse, they have two different modes of reversing. And they have a mode which is backward locomotion. So if you record from, if you take all the neurons that you recorded from and you selected, for instance, 20 neurons, and from the activity of these 20 neurons, try to predict in which of these locomotion modes the worm is engaged, you wouldn't be able to, to tell. However, if you do this dimensionality reduction using DPCA, you get a three-dimensional space. You use all neurons to, to do this adamantium to actually carry out this dimensionality reduction. And then you get this complicated manifold, which is, I, is, is, is one dimensional, intrinsic dimension, it's figure eight. You can represent it within this three dimensional space. But within this manifold, what is interesting is that every region clearly corresponds, is color coded to one of these activities, forward locomotion, a dorsal turn, a ventral turn, the two types of reverse or a backward locomotion. What is even more interesting is figure B, you don't see elegance, you have a catalog of neurons, each neuron has a name. So they did now the dimensionality reduction using data of all the worms that they had gotten data from and looking only at the neurons that were shared in their recordings. And what is fantastic is that of course in an animal in which the, the neural structure is very reproducible, this uh, actual manifold that controls allows you to predict the kind of movement that the worm is going to execute or is executing is actually a universal manifold within this higher dimensional 300 and something space of neurons that the animal has at its disposal. We ourselves were interested in investigating what happens in a more complex animal doing reaching movements. This is also a central task in two dimensions, but isometric. The animal is only, the, the subject is only asked to exert a force um, in either two dimensions or in one dimension. And then there are more complicated tasks like taking this ball, putting it at the top of the tube and, and recovering and putting it again, or exerting a force of a particular intensity. So can we find a manifold in primary motor cortex for each one of these tasks? And do the manifolds have, a, have some kind of similarity when the tasks are similar, but no much of a similarity when the tasks are very different? So we found the manifolds, again, this is all flat. This is all linear methods for dynamic dimensionality reduction. In this case, it's just uh, PCA. We moved up to 20 dimensions to capture a significant fraction of the variance. And we did, we did it for the case of, of a one-dimensional uh, 
reach out task, a two-dimensional reach out task, and then again, task, reaching task against the spring or, um, or against uh, that we're allowed to move as opposed to being isometric. And then we did these ball and tube tasks. And what we found is that all these tasks that are similar to each other because they are reaching tasks have actually very small angles. So what we did is for every task, we found a manifold, which was a hyperspace, a 20 dimensional hyperspace in the one dimensional neural space, the ambient space. So ambient space was 100, flat space dimension was 20. And we were able to compute using the concept of, of principal angles, the angles between these, these manifolds. And what we found is a collection of really small angles. This is what you would have expected if these manifolds were randomly oriented within the neural space. And this is what you actually get, that there is a collection of significantly low angles between these manifolds when we compare all the rich tasks among themselves. And the same thing when we compare the random, the, uh, a random task, a ball versus tube. So what this tells us is that within M1, each task has its own specific manifold. However, these manifolds, once you subtract the center of mass, once you subtract the mean, are not orthogonal to each other. They don't have random orientations. They share some orientations. And the next thing that we argue is that the sharing of orientation facilitates learning. And this is demonstrated by lovely work from the Batiste group in which they used actually a a brain machine interface which they recorded neural units, they obtained the manifold, they obtained the latent variables, and these latent variables were input to a decoder that controlled the cursor as opposed to the monkey controlling the cursor via a manipulando. And once the monkey became very good at that, they did a perturbation in the decoder. And the perturbation was of two types. One of them was within the manifold that was being used, while the other one was out of the manifold. And what, what they found is that the monkey very quickly adapted to a, to a perturbation in the manifold because this simply entailed doing a different linear combination of neural modes that they had already acquired. But if you now made a perturbation that tilted the direction of the decoder with components outside of the manifold, then that required acquisition of new neural modes. And that was a very slow learning process that was better carried out by in increasing gradually that out of manifold component. And I want to tell you one more uh, example before wrapping it up, which is a, an example that doesn't come from motor control, but from the interaction between V1 and V2. And in this beautiful paper by Semedo and, and collaborators, they recorded from V2, they recorded from V1, and they asked which, which directions in V1 are important for conveying information to V2. So they didn't have PCA on V1. They didn't ask in which dimensions of V1 do they find maximal variance. They asked which dimensions in V1 are optimal predictors of activity in V2. So for each neuron in V2, they, did a they found a regression dimension that means a direction in V1 that is a direction along which you get maximal increase of that V2 activity. They did do that for every V2 neuron that they recorded. And what they found is, again, a low dimensional manifold that defined the directions in which a variation in activity in V1 mattered to the activity in V2. So this is the idea of a communication subspace, which is very similar to what we found, which is there is a communication subspace in V1 within which the activity is the variables, the activity of the neural modes within that subspace are being used to maximally drive V2. But V1 has a lot of null dimensions, event dimensions in the null subspace perpendicular to this preferred uh, downstream uh, communication subspace. And that allows those neurons to do other things that V1 is involved with, which is not necessarily driving V2. Um, and I will use which is my last minute to tell you about very recent work that we did looking for the question of whether when you execute a behavior over and over again, if you are Nadal serving your tennis ball, or if you are executing a piano sonata that you love and you play every day, so your behavior is very consistent. Is there a manifold in primary motor cortex that is as stable as your behavior? So we checked for that, in a, in, again, in a very simple reaching task. 
We checked that the behavior was again very, very stable. This is a monkey that we recorded over almost two years, over two years actually, almost two years. And then you see the trajectories are very stable and the X, Y components of the velocity in the plane in which the task is being projected are also very stable. The correlation coefficients along one year are all very, very close to one. But the problem is that our, our electrode array that is implanted in this monkey is not recording from the same neurons. So if I'm not recording from the same neurons, how am I going to verify whether there is a stable manifold with stable neural dynamics? And this is what we did, and this will be uh, my, last, my last slides. We assume that there is a true manifold, the mother manifold that has 10 to the six dimensions, the true, sorry, neural space that has 10 to the six dimensions, that's an infinity. Within this space, there is a true manifold, which we don't know. We don't know how to measure it because we don't have access to all the neurons. We don't know its dimension. But in this true neural manifold, there is a latent dynamics, which is the true latent dynamics. And on day one, what we're doing is subselecting, subsampling some of the 10 to the six neurons, subsample 100 of them, and we create a neural space and we find this 20 dimensional hyperplane contains most of the activity. So those are our latent dynamics in neuron one that reside within the empirical neural manifold on day one based on the recorded neurons on day one. Then n days pass and we come and we do the same. It looks totally different, but what we found is that we can actually think of this as an object that was being projected. Imagine a three dimensional object being projected into two two dimensional planes, and now you use these low dimensional projections, you align them in order to get a better sense for what was the shape of the object in the higher dimension that you cannot possibly access. Because projections are linear, and because the, sub the, the construction of the flat manifolds is also a linear process, so there is a linear projection from the very high dimensional one million neuron space to the 100 dimensional empirical space, then there is another projection to the order of 100 dimensions, which is uh, or 20 dim from the 100 dimensions of the empirical space to the 20 dimensions obtained by PCA of the flat manifold. And both operations are linear. So we thought that maybe we would be lucky and a linear method would allow us to align the dynamics. And we were lucky. And uh, we found that we could do, use canonical correlation analysis. And to, this was, for instance, neural mode one, two, and three on day one. This was mode neural one, two, and three on day 32 for this monkey. So you can see that these things don't look similar at all. However, if we do the linear transformation that allow us to align the dynamics, now day one and day 32 look very similar to each other. And moreover, we have some kind of, of, of untangled the representation. There is a lot of discussion about tangles and untangles of representations, but they are just linear relationships that allow us to untangle this representation and you can see that the petals again correspond to the different targets <laughs> and they are once more organized topologically in the same way in which the targets are organized topologically in the external space. So we are once more recovering this spatial structure of the task. And this is the great points are how the, the degree of correlation, the degree of alignment if you measure morning and afternoon of the same day if you compare across days separated by 10 or 20 or 30 days, then the correlation is very, very poor. But after we use the alignment method, we go to the red data points, which are uh, the, result, the result of alignment, which is as good as within the error bars as having done this in, um, on day one. And this, of course, for those of us who are interested in brain machine interfaces is absolutely great because it allows us not to change the decoder. If we train the decoder with data on day one, and we can map every day activity onto the activity on day one by using this very simple linear alignment process, then we never need to change the decoder. And we can maintain, this is the blue data, we can maintain the quality of the, of the decoder, the, the performance of the decoder, without having to ask the subject to adapt every few days to a new decoder. It's like, you know, sort of learning to drive a different bicycle, ride a different bicycle every day. The decoder will no longer feel like an extension of yourself if we keep on changing it every few days. So in, in the monkey uh, C, which is the monkey for we have longest data, we have been able to show that, as I said, over the span 
of two years, which is you know, that's, that really has never been done before. And I'll finish here, just reminding you that we were able to do all this with linear methods. So the philosophy in our group is always first apply all the battery of linear method problem, extract from that as much as we can. Where it fails will give us a guidance of what kind of nonlinear methods to adopt. But let's first learn all that we can from using methods for, for linear dimensionality reduction. Thank you. Uh, please come to the front to ask questions. Hi, this was a great talk, thank you. Um, I just had a curiosity question. So you said in the last part that the dynamics are, um, sorry, the, the embedding uh, shows common dynamics across different days. Um, do you also see that across monkeys, subjects? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, my colleague, Matt Perich, which is now uh, in New York, has been doing that. And um, I hate, to, I hate to take the bang out of his announcement when he comes out with me, but the answer is yes, which is totally amazing because yes. we can record from 100 neurons in monkey A and another 100 neurons in monkey B, found a 20-dimensional flat manifold in each one of them, and for these very simple stereotype tasks as this reach out, center out uh, task with eight targets, which the monkeys are overtrained, so let me make all these caveats, but within that scenario, of a very stereotypical behavior, we can align and we find a common manifold. That's really cool. I'm excited about those results. Thank you. Totally cool because it makes us think that if I had a monkey and a human, both of them trained to do over trained to do the central task, I can use the monkey data to predict, to construct a good decoder for a human because I can align the human data to the monkey data. Um, so I guess actually I have a related question in a way. Um, what concerns me with all kinds of dimensionality reduction um, approaches is what's the right null model because there's something about the task that's imposing a low dimensional structure, um, especially here if you can actually go across monkeys. Um, I know that in your latest paper there is some thorough controls, um, but I haven't actually myself had the time to really read them thoroughly. So what kind of controls do you do to kind of compare to an appropriate null model? There is a beautiful paper of um, El Sayed and Cunningham, where they discuss precisely this question. And the question that they ask is more fundamental even than the one you ask, because they ask, okay, now we are all talking about population models, but how do we know that this could not have been explained with a very simple single neuron model times n, where n is the number of neurons that you're recording from. And they propose a very, very nice method, which is essentially a maximal entropy method in which you decide which conditions you want to preserve, and then it gives you the most uh, the most random model that is consistent with those constraints. And this is the, what we need to generate this model. So we constrain the, the manifolds to preserve within, let's say, the 10 dimensional manifold that we found at, two at random and computed the angle between them, had to represent the same covariance matrix as in the data. So they were not completely random hyperplanes in that, in that space, but preserve some. So you have to be honest with yourself and not give yourself a, a, a null hypothesis that is so obvious that you will obviously be significantly different from it. You have to do an honest, make an honest effort to break your model really and, and impose the conditions and then find the most random and possible hypothesis within those constraints. And I really recommend the El Sayed and, and Cunningham paper. It's a, it's a beautiful way of doing it. Very principled. Okay, let's uh, thanks Sarah again for giving such a great talk. Um,